So you want to convert light into an electrical current. Maybe you're working on a military or aerospace project, or maybe some kind of medical imaging design where you need a transimpedance amplifier to convert that current into a usable voltage. Or maybe you just want to geek out on everything related to photodiode transimpedance amplifiers. Well, my friends, you've come to the right place. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Ed Mullins from Analog Devices and I talk about the what, where, and how of photodiode amplifiers. We discuss the challenges involved in designing these kinds of components, the best practices for analyzing the stability of photodiode amplifiers, and how analog devices can help you with your next photodiode amplifier design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from analog devices. Hi, Ed. Thank you so much for joining me. Hey, uh, thank you very much, Amelia. I'm very happy to be here today. Excellent. Okay, so we're talking all about photodiode amplifiers today. But Ed, for my audience who may not know, what exactly are photodiode amplifiers? Yeah, well, light-to-voltage conversion is a common application useful in a variety of analytical instruments, field instruments, medical imaging, and aerospace and defense systems. And while there's many ways to measure light, a common way is to use a photodiode combined with a transimpedance amplifier. The photodiode will produce an output current that's proportional to the amount of optical power striking the photodiode. And the transimpedance amplifier is used to convert the photocurrent to a voltage where it can be eventually converted to digital and uh, further processed. Getting started on a transimpedance design can be daunting as there's a lot of choices to make when selecting the photodiode and the amplifier. But once all the components of interest are identified, the task of designing the light to voltage converter is fraught with a few technical challenges. So in the next little bit, we'd like to explore how to get a jump start on the most commonly encountered technical aspects of a transimpedance design and get on a path for a first pass PCB success. Excellent. Okay, so can you explain that transimpedance amplifier a bit more? Yeah, sure. The simplest form of a TIA is shown here in the schematic diagram. The photodiode will produce an output current that's indicated with the arrow in response to being subjected to light. And in this circuit, the op amp will force the voltage across the photodiode to remain near zero, ensuring a linear response to the incident light. And the photo current will flow from the op amp's output through the feedback resistor, forcing the output of the op amp to increase with increasing amounts of light striking the photodiode. The output of this circuit is given by the photo current multiplied by the value of the feedback resistance. And if you have this feedback capacitance, the bandwidth of the amplifier will be given by the 1 over 2 pi RF CF value for that combination of components. And while the circuit appears very simple, it's fraught with a few specific design challenges. So uh, we should probably just jump right in and see how this whole thing works. Absolutely. Let's talk about the functions of the photodiode. All righty. Great place to start. So there's many varieties and more exotic configurations of photodiode, but the simplest form of a photodiode is nothing more than a PN junction that's exposed to light. And each photon striking the photodiode will have an energy given by the equation shown here, which is hc over lambda, h being Planck's constant, c being the speed of light, and lambda being the wavelength of the photon. And if the photon has sufficient energy, it'll create an electron hole pair, and that'll result in a photocurrent. So interestingly, this current flows in the reverse direction from cathode to anode, just like a leakage current might. The photodiode small signal model is shown to include several passive elements, but honestly, in many practical applications, modeling the photodiode with an ideal current source and just its junction capacitance is sufficient. And in the case where no light is shining on the photodiode, there's still going to be a leakage current present, and this current is known as the dark current. Okay, so Ed, I would imagine that designing these types of components can be difficult. Indeed, there are challenges. In precision instrumentation applications, it's desirable to measure low levels of light. 
and this requirement results in selecting a photodiode with as much light gathering area as possible. And that kind of means large area photodiodes and they're going to result in large junction capacitance. To amplify the low levels of photocurrent, a large transimpedance value, so a large resistor value in the feedback loop, is going to be required. And these can frequently be in the megaohm range or even higher in the gigaohm range. But the combination of the large input capacitance from the photodiode and large transimpedance value or resistance value will create challenges with respect to stability, noise, and bandwidth. So what we want is a circuit that responds quickly to the light source without a lot of overshoot and ringing or even worse, sustained oscillations. So Ed, how would we analyze this stability? So a common method to analyze the stability of an amplifier is to use what we call the rate of closure method. ROC for short can be derived from the simple block diagram shown here. The idea is to solve for the closed loop gain V out divided by V in. And at this time, it's probably worth noting that we specifically want to point out that the input is connected to the non-inverting input of this closed loop system. With writing just a few equations, we can quickly determine that the closed loop gain is equal to A over 1 plus A beta. Now, A is the open loop gain of the amplifier. Beta is the feedback factor, which is defined as the amount of output fed back to the input. And the product, A beta, is also known as the loop gain. And when we take a look at that result, there are two interesting limits that we can derive for this expression. So the first limit that we want to take a look at is when we take the limit of the closed loop gain expression when A goes to infinity. After a little bit of analysis, we can conclude that the ideal closed loop gain will reduce to simply 1 over beta. The second interesting limit to derive is when the loop gain itself, the product of A beta, approaches minus 1. And this will result with the denominator of the equation tending towards 0, and that will imply that the closed loop gain will approach infinity. At the point where the loop gain is minus 1, the circuit will become unstable, and this can result in the sustained oscillations. So further rearranging the terms in that second limit that we just explored, we can see when the loop gain A beta equals minus 1 is equivalent to when the magnitude of A is equal to the magnitude of 1 over beta at a phase shift of 180 degrees. It's helpful to have a good understanding of simple Bode plots to perform this rate of closure analysis. And as an example, take a look at the Bode plot here I've shown. It's a simple first order low pass filter. And if you notice, the amount of phase shift a decade before the pole frequency is, you know, approximately zero degrees. And also note that in that region of the curve, the slope of the magnitude plot is zero dB per decade. And if we go a little higher in frequency, maybe uh, let's go a decade beyond the pole frequency, you'll see that the amount of phase shift is just flattens out at 90 degrees. And also note that in this region of the curve, the slope of the magnitude plot is minus 20 dB per decade. So in this way, you can make approximate correlation between the slopes of the magnitude curve and the amount of phase shift that has occurred. So taking those results, we can conclude that to use the rate of closure method, we only need to draw the open loop gain versus frequency of the amplifier and the closed loop gain from the non-inverting terminal to the output on the same graph. And what we want to do then is observe where those two terms, A, are equal to 1 over beta, and observe the rate of closure between those two curves, which helps us to understand the amount of phase shift. So if the rate of closure between those two curves is 20 dB per decade, the circuit will be stable. If the rate of closure is 40 dB per decade, the circuit is unstable. Performing stability analysis using the rate of closure technique will provide insight into, of course, the stability of the circuit. It will also provide any hints if there is a problem with the circuit. We'll see what's causing it, and then we'll know how to fix it. Once you have a grasp on the stability analysis by using the simple hand analysis method, I would always recommend to augment that with doing some SPICE simulations using LT-SPICE to get more precise results. And LT Spice, if you don't have it, can be found on the Analog Devices website. Download it for free. To better understand the relationship between phase shift and the slopes of the Bode plots for the open loop and closed loop gain, 
Recognize that the low frequency pole in the op amp's open loop response A results in 90 degrees of phase shift one decade beyond the low frequency pole. This is synonymous with that minus 20 dB per decade sloping region of the AOL curve. Recognize also that the feedback resistor and input capacitance form a pole in the feedback network beta. Now this is synonymous with forming a zero in the closed loop gain, the ideal closed loop gain, which we also call one over beta. So at frequencies a decade beyond that zero frequency in the closed loop gain response, this results in 90 degrees of phase shift, and that's synonymous with that plus 20 dB per decade sloped region on the closed loop gain curve. So, if the two curves are approaching each other at a rate of 40 dB per decade, then we have 90 degrees of phase shift from the op amp and another 90 degrees of phase shift due to the pole in the feedback path, or as we like to say, a zero in the closed loop gain response. And all this results in an overall 180 degrees phase shift and the loop gain magnitude is one, and this will meet the criteria for an unstable circuit. Okay, so Ed, what kind of solution would help with this stability issue? So now that we can see from the Bode plots and the rate of closure analysis that the root cause of the stability issue is the zero in the closed loop gain transfer function, we need to come up with a solution that adds a pole to compensate for the effect of that zero. So if we place a capacitor in parallel with the feedback resistor, it'll provide such a solution. The basic concept is to place the pole frequency that's formed with the feedback capacitor and feedback resistor such that that pole frequency occurs prior to the intercept with the open loop gain curve. This is going to result in a rate of closure of 20 dB per decade and a stable circuit. And while it might seem challenging to draw the plot for the closed loop gain versus frequency, it's worth pointing out that we can intuitively understand what's happening by examining the closed loop gain at low frequency and at high frequency. Uh, at very low frequencies, the capacitors will have high impedance, and for the sake of performing an intuitive analysis, we could just think of them as open circuits. As this is the case at low frequencies, we can then by inspection conclude that the closed loop gain from the non-averting input, where Vn is shown on the schematic, to the output is going to be gain of 1 or 0 dB. As the frequency increases, at some point, the capacitive reactance of the input capacitance is going to react with the feedback resistance, and it will form that zero in the closed-loop transfer function, and the gain will start to increase at a rate of 20 dB per decade. The next inflection point that occurs in our closed-loop gain plot is when the impedance of the feedback capacitor reaches the same magnitude as the feedback resistor. At that frequency, the pole is formed, and the gain starts to flatten out. Beyond these frequencies, the feedback capacitor will have a lower impedance than the feedback resistor. And for the sake, again, of performing just simple, quick, intuitive analysis, the feedback resistor can be thought of as an open circuit. So that all said, the closed loop gain at frequencies beyond that RF-CF pole frequency is determined by the ratio of the input capacitance and the feedback capacitance. Now, since both capacitors have an impedance that decreases with frequency, the ratio remains constant, and hence the Bode plot will have that 0 dB per decade slope. The bandwidth of this transimpedance amp will be limited by the parallel combination of RF and CF, but limiting the bandwidth in this way not only improves the stability, but also helps us to reduce noise. So, Ed, where would noise be coming from in these photodiode TIA circuits? Well, there's four sources of noise in this TIA circuit. The op amp's voltage noise generator, the op amp's current noise generator, the shot noise coming from the photodiode, and the voltage noise coming from the feedback resistor. And I always find it's helpful to draw schematic that includes all these noise sources just to help keep track of each one of those during our noise analysis. Okay, so after we identify the source of the noise, Ed, what's next? Well, after we have an idea where the noise sources are within the circuit, the next step would be to identify the magnitude of each noise source and how that noise source behaves over frequency. So the op amp has two noise sources, a voltage noise source and a current noise source. And information regarding these noise sources can be found in the amplifier's data sheet in a typical curve section. So pretty much everything you need to know for the op amp's noise source is just right there in the cute little pictures you see here. Excellent. So you also mentioned shot noise earlier as well. So what would that look like? 
All right. Well, shot noise is always associated with a DC current flowing through a PN junction. Electrons and holes are created within a depletion layer of a photodiode, and they'll arrive at the edges of the depletion layer and they'll result in photogenerated current. But those charged carriers, the electrons and holes, they're going to arrive at the depletion layer edges at random time intervals. And this results in like a little bit of a noise added to that otherwise DC current that was flowing. And the magnitude of that noise is given by the equation shown here in the table. Shot noise will have a flat spectral density versus frequency, and it results from both the dark current of the photodiode as well as any signal current if you have signal current present in your photodiode when you're calculating the noise. Shot noise is modeled as a current source placed at the same location in the circuit as the photodiode. So the feedback resistor also displays noise, and it displays what we call thermal noise. And thermal noise is a result of the random motion of electrons in a conductor due to thermal energy. The magnitude of the thermal voltage noise voltage for a resistor is given in the equation in the table here. And thermal noise is modeled as a voltage source placed in series with the feedback resistor. And thermal noise is also assumed to have a flat spectral density over the frequency range of interest. The next step in the noise analysis is to refer each of those noise sources to the output node. And the first step in this process is to use standard circuit analysis techniques and identify the transfer function from each noise source to the output. So, for example, the transfer function for the op-amp voltage noise source, let's just look at it. And we say, well, by inspection, it's going to be 1 plus ZF over ZN where ZF is the impedance of the parallel combination of RF and CF, and ZN is the impedance of the input capacitance. The transfer function from the photodiode, shot noise source, and the op-amp current noise source, because they're both connected to the inverting input terminal, is just simply the transimpedance of the amplifier itself. So in this case, it would be the parallel combination of RF and CF. And lastly, the transfer function of the voltage noise source associated with the feedback resistor is simply one because it's already connected directly to the output. So using the transfer function equations, the next step is to refer all those noise sources to the output and add them together. But because noise signals are random in nature and they're uncorrelated to each other, we don't add them up linearly. We're going to add them up as the square root of the sum of the squares. And the good news is, since there's no particular phase relationships with noise sources, you don't need to keep track of any negative signs in any of your analysis. You only need to keep track of the magnitudes. Okay, so how do we determine how much total noise we have? All right, well, taking a look at the upper graph, we see that we've identified the small signal bandwidth. And if we're looking at the area under the curve of that graph, we're going to notice that there's going to be some additional noise beyond the small signal bandwidth. And that's represented by that triangular area that I've shown shaded here. The concept of noise bandwidth is to create a rectangular shape that has the same area as that triangular area. So for a first-order circuit, this is going to result in a noise bandwidth that is 1.57 or conveniently pi over 2, times the small signal bandwidth. And we think of taking that triangular shape and making it a rectangular shape through that simple transformation. And this way, performing the integration is simple as just taking the area of a rectangular shape. So the fact that we have to integrate this complex-looking curve shouldn't be too overwhelming because we're going to simplify it and we're just integrating the area of a rectangle. And that's pretty straightforward. So we want to estimate the noise in the 1 over F region. And that's performed by using the equation shown here. So what you'd want to do is to determine the noise spectral density at 1 hertz. And then you want to multiply that by the square root of the natural log of the upper frequency divided by the lower frequency. Now, the upper frequency indicated as F high here. It's also known as the corner frequency. And that is where the 1 over F part of that noise curve intercepts the broadband part of the noise curve. So that'll give us a definite value for the high frequency. And honestly, the low frequency, it's a little bit arbitrary to say, well, how low do you go? Do you go to 0.1 hertz, 0.01 hertz? For that part of the analysis, I think using 0.1 hertz in most cases is plenty adequate. And what you'll find at the end here when you go through all this calculation and a real example is the noise associated with the low frequency part of this curve is generally completely overwhelmed by the broadband noise, and the low-frequency noise, therefore, can more often than not just be ignored.
So, Ed, what about that broadband noise you mentioned? How do we estimate that? Uh, yes. So to estimate the broadband noise, we're simply going to take that output referred noise spectral density and multiply it by the square root of the noise bandwidth. So this is going to give us units of volts RMS. And for a first order system, we're going to determine the noise bandwidth to be 1.57 times our small signal bandwidth. Now, in reality, if you have a little uh, higher order circuit, maybe you have a second order or third order type transfer function, you can refer to the table here for the various multiplying factors. And then lastly, what you want to do is when you calculated the low frequency noise in the 1 over F region and the broadband noise, you want to go ahead and add those up. And since they're uncorrelated to each other, you again want to add them up as the square root of the sum of the squares. And that's almost certainly where you're going to find that the broadband noise completely dominates the low frequency noise in applications that have a lot of bandwidth. So if my audience wants to design a low noise TIA, what kind of design considerations should they keep in mind? Oh, yeah, sure. So let's uh, target a low noise TIA suitable for maybe like, I don't know, blood analysis application. So the application will require a large area photodiode to collect a lot of monolight. And it's going to require a large trans impedance to amplify the small photo current. So we can set some targets here for our design parameters and say we're going to have a 10 mega ohm trans impedance. We'll assume that we'll get no more than 350 nanoamps out of the photodiode. So that'll give us a maximum output voltage of, say, three and a half volts. It's a blood analysis instrument that we're uh, anticipating here. So we'll say we only need a kilohertz of bandwidth. But we do want a noise suitable for a 16-bit system. So if we used a 4.096 reference on this system, then we would want to have less than 30 microvolts RMS of total noise. That would meet our 16-bit criteria. So I've selected a BPW34 photodiode. This uh, photodiode has a large active area that will help us gather a lot of light. It has a spectral response from 400 nanometers to about 1,100 nanometers. But it's going to come with 72 picofarads of junction capacitance. And the specifications for the photodiode are just found on the product data sheet for that particular diode. Now, for the amplifier, I've selected the ADA4510 from analog devices, what we call an ultra-precision amplifier. It has 20 microvolts max offset, but it uses Digitrim technology. So there's no chopper clocks or any of that kind of noise creeping into the system. Yet this amplifier has very low drift, 70 nanovolts per degree C typical, very low input bias current, 10 picoamps max. It has 10 megahertz bandwidth, is just very suitable for these types of trans impedance applications. It's a 40 volt rail to rail in, rail throughout amplifier. I like to say it's my new favorite amplifier. All right, so I've gone ahead and drawn a schematic that shows this, and I've also drawn the stability graphs based on the components that I've selected here. And you can see, if I don't place that compensating capacitor, we're going to see that closed-loop gain with a dotted line behavior, and that's going to intercept the open-loop gain at that rate of 40 dB per decade. So we would definitely have an unstable circuit. So we're going to have to place that 15 picofarad capacitor for the purposes of stabilizing the circuit. The good news is, since we set the bandwidth of the circuit also with the combination of the feedback capacitance and the feedback resistance, just selecting that to be one kilohertz cutoff frequency, we can solve both the stability issue and reduce the noise of the circuit all in kind of one fell swoop. Excellent. Now, what's the next step in the testing process? All right. Well, I would recommend a quick transient simulation using LT Spice just to confirm the results match our expectations. To demonstrate the need for that compensating capacitor, I've run the simulations with and without that cap. And you can see there's a lot of overshoot and ringing. And uh, once I place the capacitor, we have a nice stable response. I do want to point out in the circuit without the compensating capacitor, I did include 0.1 picofarads of just what I would regard as parasitic capacitance. There's no such thing as zero capacitance in the real world. You're going to have self-capacitance from the feedback resistor. You're going to have PCB trace capacitance and pin capacitance on the amplifier itself. So I threw in 0.1 puff, and that seemed like a pretty good approximation for parasitic capacitance. What I also did, because of what I want to do is connect the dots between this very simple rate of closure method and the LT-SPICE simulations, I want to augment that with some actual measured results. 
So what I did is I built a little prototype that plugs into a module, an active learning module called the ADLM 2000. Now this ADLM 2000, I like to refer to that as a lab in my shirt pocket. It has a couple of channels of an oscilloscope. It has a couple of channels of a waveform generator, a couple of channels of a programmable power supply. And honestly, I just plug in my board there and I configure the ADLM through the free software that's available for it. And I can go ahead and uh, flash the LED and make measurements and see the response. And as you can see, our hand analysis very adequately predicted. We didn't fix that amplifier. We're going to have a stability problem. And sure enough, LT Spice and the measured results look pretty darn similar. And then go ahead and place the compensating capacitor there. We see that both in simulation and the measured results, we get a very stable response and they kind of look very similar. So what that tells me is I feel pretty good about this rate of closure method, the ability to simulate and get proper results in LT Spice, and to see the uh, results in the real world with actual measurements and hardware. So the next thing we want to do is take a look at this noise and do the noise analysis. Let's take a look at it at one kilohertz. That's the bandwidth of our circuit. Then we want to refer all those noise sources to the output. Then we want to add them up as a square root sum of the squares. And then we'll augment that with simulations in LT Spice. So what you see here is I've done all the hand calculations, and the results that are shown here are already referred to the output, and they're indicated with their kind of naming convention here as to where the source is in the circuit. So, for example... The op amp's voltage noise source, when referred to the output at 1 kilohertz, was about 37 nanovolts per root hertz. Similarly, for the op amp current noise, was 120 nanovolts per root hertz. The photodiode shot noise uh, associated with the dark current was 80 nanovolts per root hertz. And the big contributor in the low frequencies there was the feedback resistance from the 10 meg at 400 nanovolts per root hertz. And when you sum all those up as the square root of sum of squares, you get about 427 nanovolts per root hertz. So now that we have a kind of an understanding of how the circuit behaves, now it's time to simulate. So we throw that in LT Spice and we run the dot noise analysis. And what we'll see is this output referred noise spectral density curve. Now, the good news is at low frequencies, our hand analysis is pretty much spot on to exactly what LT Spice is simulating. So we feel pretty good about that. But I do have to say, you see this little red highlighted area here. There's this little extra bump in that noise spectral density curve that we certainly didn't predict with our little hand analysis just now. And as you can see, there's a lot of area under that portion of the curve beyond the bandwidth of our part. And if we remember that the area under these uh, noise spectral density curves relates to total noise, this is telling us that we probably have a noise problem here. And... The next challenge is to find out where's that extra noise coming from? Why is it there? Okay. So if we're looking at these individual noise contributors, what does that look like in this analysis step? All right. Shown here are the output referred individual noise contributor spectral densities versus frequency. Now, truth be told, I created these plots by performing quite a bit of additional hand analysis and in fact, I even wrote some scripts and simulated this in another program just to make these curves. And literally that analysis was, I have to admit, it was a little painful and it actually took several hours. What we can notice at first is that one kilohertz and below, we've accurately predicted all the results from our previous simple hand analysis. So everything looks great below a kilohertz. But after one kilohertz, we see that the dominant noise source is coming from that blue curve and that's the op-amp current noise. Well, geez, why would that be? If we look at input bias current noise for any JFET or CMOS amplifier, you'll find that they increase with frequency. This is a normal phenomenon for any JFET or CMOS amplifier. And the question is, well, how does that actually impact our total noise in the circuit? Well, because the trans impedance of this amplifier is limited in bandwidth to one kilohertz from the combination of 15 picofarads and 10 megohms, the trans impedance is decreasing with frequency. At the same time, the input noise current spectral density is increasing with frequency. The result is after about a kilohertz or so, you have a flat noise spectral density when referred to the output of the amplifier and that's due to the input bias current reacting with the trans impedance. And that happens to be at a magnitude that dominates all other noise sources. So 
now that we've seen where that noise source is coming from, it's very simple to how to deal with and get rid of it. And we simply just place a low pass filter at the output of the amplifier and that'll wipe out all that additional noise coming from the noise current source of the amplifier. So when it comes to the entire noise, what does that look like with an RC filter and without one? All right, so we saw the first simulation results and I've kind of repeated them here where we're looking at the noise spectral density at the output and we see that bump and that's uh, extra area in the noise. And in LT Spice, you have a convenient feature that will allow you to calculate the total noise. It's basically computing the area under the noise power spectral density curve. Well, anyway, with a few mouse clicks, you can see that the total noise in this circuit is 320 microvolts RMS, and that far exceeds anything we want to deal with for a 16-bit system. But when we place the external RC filter, we can see that the total noise is reduced down to 15 microvolts, which is actually about half the target that we had planned out in the first place. But when we actually calculate by hand the total noise by taking that 427 nanovolts per square root hertz noise spectral density, when we multiply that by the square root of the noise bandwidth, we actually came up with 16 microvolts as our guesstimate in our hand analysis. And you can see that matches very closely now that we have the circuit tuned in properly. So, Ed, if my audience needs a little assistance with their next design, how can analog devices help them? Oh, well, that's a great question. And I'm really glad we're having this part of the conversation because when I was tracking down those individual sources of noise across the entire frequency spectrum, it did take a lot of grinding and a lot of uh, thought and brain power and a couple of hours to get through all that. But Analog Devices offers a suite of tools. It's called the ADI Precision Studio. You can find that on our website. And when you go to the ADI Precision Studio, inside there, there's a bunch of tools that you can use to help simplify and speed up your design process. For example, there's an analog filter tool. But the tool that I used to perform this analysis is the Signal Chain Designer tool. And that's a brand new feature to the ADI Precision Studio. What it allows you to do is drag and drop and select the type of sensor that you have and configure it with the proper specifications. And you can drag and drop pre-configured uh, circuit elements onto your schematic. So for example, in this case, I selected a photodiode for my sensor. I selected a transimpedance diagram. And when you go ahead and you place it on your blocks, you can configure each of those blocks with the right values. So you can go to the photodiode data sheet, get all that information, type it right into the pre-populated fields for the sensor. And similarly with the uh, schematic for the transimpedance section, you can configure the feedback resistance, the capacitance. You can select which op amp you're considering from a list of choices and all analog devices op amps are available there. What you can do is view various types of analysis, like a common one would be to do the AC analysis. But this one in particular, I wanted to show the noise analysis feature. And lo and behold, here you go. The curves you're looking at, the black curve is the total noise of the circuit. And it might be hard to see with the small fonts, but that green curve that's kind of going up after our bandwidth of the amplifier here is the noise resulting from that input bias current noise that's increasing. And as you can see, out at higher frequencies, this tool does show us that that is the dominant source of noise. So now, by looking at this tool, we get all that information that literally took me a few hours to grind out by hand to getting this view less than five minutes. So it's a very efficient tool. It gives you wonderful insights into what's going on with your design. There's a lot of different views available to look at where all the noise, for example, is coming from. This is my particular favorite view. What I can do now is I can just drag a filter block onto the block diagram and then configure it for a one kilohertz cutoff frequency, and that'll place an RC at the output of this amplifier and everything will be great and the noise will be reduced. So literally, I could do what took me probably three or four hours I can do in five minutes or less with this tool. It's pretty amazing. When you're all finished, 
and you like your design here, you can export it to a LT Spice schematic that is then downloadable onto your laptop or your computer. So you have your own set of files. The LT Spice schematic will be ready to simulate with just the click of one button. It has all the spice directives that you need to run these noise analysis or the AC simulations or whatever it is that you've done here in this studio signal chain tool. Fantastic. Now, Ed, what kind of ADI solutions would you suggest here? Well, for the simple TIA, I took a look at the ADA 4510. It's a 40-volt rail-to-rail CMOS input, so it has very low input bias current. Digi-trim, which is a way that we trim the device after it's been packaged. We trim the offset, we trim the offset drift, and we get amazing DC precision. We get wide bandwidth of 10 megahertz, about 20 volts per microsecond slew rate, and it's low noise. So it's really a wonderful all-around amplifier. There's going to be many photodiode applications like erbium dope fiber amplifiers where you're doing some power monitoring, communication systems, where you might need two photodiodes and you might be space constrained. And even more challenging is you might need to have a very wide dynamic range trans impedance amplifier. Now, the way trans impedance amplifiers can be configured for very wide dynamic range is to use multiple feedback elements configured with switches. And if you were to build all that discreetly, it takes up a lot of area. The ADA4351 is also a pretty brand new product from analog devices, and it's designed specifically for two trans impedance amplifiers to be connected to photodiodes. And it includes all the switches so you can select two different trans impedance configurations for each amplifier. And allows you the very wide dynamic range with all that features and functionality in a very tiny three millimeter by three millimeter footprint. So, Ed, I was really interested in that active learning module as well. Tell me more about that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is uh, my new favorite lab, I like to say, too. I can carry it around anywhere I go. It's pretty fun. The ADLM 2000, we call it active learning module. You can find it on analog.com forward slash ADLM 2000. And it's a USB-based instrument. So, basically, it just comes with a cable. You plug it into your computer, your laptop. You get two channels of a uh, plus or minus 20 volt, 30 megahertz oscilloscope. You get two channels of a voltmeter, two channels of a spectrum analyzer, two channels of an arbitrary function generator, digital logic analyzer, serial bus protocol analyzers, 16 channel pattern generator, and a generous amount of digital I.O. and a network analyzer. And it comes with two programmable power supplies. So everything you need to fire up a circuit and do some basic measurements you stimulate the circuit and measure the response right here. As you can see in this image, I've gone ahead and designed a lot of my little first build prototypes just to plug right into this thing. You can go ahead and configure the software and I can start displaying results literally in a few minutes. It's pretty amazing for the value that you get here or for the features you get. It's a very low cost tool. So it's targeted for um, university students and training. And that's why we call it the active learning module. So very affordable. Cool. All right. Well, Ed, where should my audience go for more information? Well, we can always start at analog.com. From there, you can find topics on stability training and noise training. So if you look at the titles of these uh, articles I've provided here in the blue, you can see one megahertz single supply photodiode trans impedance amplifier TIA design. If you go ahead and put that into the search box, that'll take you to this article and it'll walk you through all the details of how to perform the rate of closure analysis with a lot of different examples. Similar for the noise training, if you just type in step-by-step -step noise analysis guide for your signal chain, you're going to come back with a tutorial that walks you through everything you need to know about performing these types of noise analysis. You can navigate to the ADA4510 or the ADA4351 product pages where you'll find data sheets. You can find evaluation boards. You can find SPICE models. The ADLM2000 uh, Active Learning Module, you just type that in. It'll take you right to that page. You can see all the detailed features again for that product. You can get the pricing information and learn how to order that. You can also see there's a wiki page that comes with all the documentation and tells you exactly how to use it and how to download the free software called Scopy that is used as graphical user interface that allows you to configure this thing and make your measurements. The same thing with the Precision Studio, and you get access to all the tools right online. Excellent. Well, Ed, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. 
Hey, you're very welcome, Amelia. And it was really nice spending the time with you and your audience today. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from analog devices. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.